I just can't deal with it. Okay, so we are on week six, or well, yeah, week six and part six is the same thing of Job, and we're gonna look at the the ending of the book, the finale, what's happened so far. The first two chapters um, it focuses more on on a dialogue between God and Satan, and then uh, he, he loses pretty much everything, not everything, but pretty much everything, and his uh, his wife's support and his friend's support and his health. Um, but it is important to note, note, to note that he, he didn't lose everything. He did still have some things. So, um, anyways, um, I did like that Tim Hawkins joke, though. Which, yeah, right? I'm telling you guys, I think he's onto something. I know he said it as a joke, but man, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. It does. <laughs> okay. Um, so then after after he gets in, in a lengthy dispute between his three friends, which three rounds of arguing with each of them, except for the last one doesn't talk the last time, making a grand total of eight replies, or whatever, yeah. um, then a, a young guy that just has nothing to do with the situation, uh, Elihu, he's, he speaks up, then after he's done... It just skips right past. There's there's no response to it, no nothing, and which is kind of odd because the whole book has hinged like a drama, like a play. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's had its characters that it introduced, had dialogue, had had discourse between the two, and then they they left stage. Well, Elihu is like seems more of an interruption to anything. You know, <laughs> there's no interruption to his dialogue. I mean, there no response to his dialogue. God and Satan had dialogue. Job and his friends had dialogue. Everyone in the book has dialogue, except for Elihu. It's just odd. Um, so, a few last things. First off, suffering can be helpful or harmful depending on how we respond. Um, for instance, I have this. Um, this is called the Life Application <laughs> Study Bible. And it says a few things I thought were kind of interesting, so I wanted to read them to you. It says... A contrast of the two. Suffering is helpful when we turn to God for understanding, uh, endurance, and deliverance. When we ask important questions we might not take time to think about in our normal routine. Um, it's helpful when we um, are prepared by it to identify with and comfort others who suffer. Um, it's helpful when we are open to being helped by others who are obeying God. It's helpful when we are ready to learn from a trustworthy God. It's helpful when we realize um, we can identify uh, with what Christ suffered on the cross for us, um, and it's helpful when we are sensitized to the amount of suffering in the world. And then on the other side, it says suffering is harmful when we become hardened and reject God, we refuse to ask any questions and miss any lessons that might be good for us, we allow to make us self-centered and selfish, we withdraw from the help others can give, we reject the fact that God can bring good out of calamity, we accuse God of being unjust and perhaps lead others to reject Him, or we refuse to be open to any changes in our lives. So really, the idea of of, 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 of suffering. I mean, everyone's going to suffer. Now, I know Jesus said, you know, times of testing will come, but woe to those through whom it comes. Uh, so I'm not I'm not excusing people who bring testing by. It's not like they get a free ticket because we're, we're growing from the process. Right. But um, with that being said, it, it, everyone's going to go through suffering. The, 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 the real key part is, is how are you going to respond to it? And I think that that's really important. In fact, in the book of Job, remember, Job never gets an answer. The question of why do the righteous suffer is never answered in the book of Job, but that's the entire point of the book of Job. That tells me that there's something there that we're actually supposed to think about rather than just getting an easy answer. And, you know, for those of you who have gone through severe times of testing that you're just wondering what the crap is going on, God, how many times did you actually want just a very simple answer from God? You have? No, 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 but oh, you I want it. Oh, I get you. Because uh, usually when I'm in those situations, it's like, and when I'm talking to people who are in those situations, they're, they're just kind of like, you know, they'll ask a bunch of questions, but they don't really want the answer. I mean, if you give them the answer, they'll probably even get mad at you. You know what I mean? Most of the time when people are going through suffering, they, they're they more frustrated than anything. Well, Not all the time, obviously. Well, so. I just want, want to know why. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, which is exactly what Job said. Yeah. You know, why? <laughs> um, so God is not bound by a law of fairness. 
justice, the whole idea, the whole concept of justice is an emanation. That means it, it, is, um, it comes from God. Justice only exists as so long as God exists. See what I mean? Because justice is a part of God's character, that things go rightly. See what I mean? P some people think that there's this law of justice that's just in inherent in the world. It's just incorruptible. It's unchanging. It's always there. Things have to be just. They have to be fair. And God himself has to be subject to this law that exists. But justice itself is only exists because God exists. It is because justice exists because that's who God is. So he's not held to that standard. He is the standard. There's a big difference there. That means that sometimes God's going to do something that we perceive as un unjust because we don't understand. Because our ideals of justice and his ideals of justice are not the same. Um, okay. So a lot, of, a lot, of, a large part of this is realizing, not realizing that there's a difference between us and God. Um, so then, also in this, um, I wanted to reference this. If you are in sin, now in, in Job, in the book of Job, Job was not living in sin. He was going through these things, but it had nothing to do with he sinned to have gotten to have earned it or something. Excuse me, I'm having some bad burps. So with that, actually, I'm not going to read that exactly. Um, the idea here, though, is if you are if you are being punished by God for sin, well, it's a very simple solution. Confess your sin. Right. Um, if, if Satan is attacking you, well, then you don't need to ask, then you don't need to ask for forgiveness. You need to ask God for strength. If um, if God is if if God is getting ready to call you to something and you're going through something because God has bigger plans for you, then resist the urge to to settle in self pity. You know what I mean? Um, there has to be a point when you say, "Look, th this may not be fair, but I'm going to make the best out of it. I'm going to learn from this process." Um, and then there's also the the, the situation of you know, if, you know y you might just God have, God whatever has called you to this test. Um, but there's a lot of different things, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but moral of the story being, if you are in sin, repent. And that's actually a part of Job. See, in the book of Job, it's, it's, it's a book of extremes. Job was blameless. He was going through something because he didn't sin. But if you are a person who's reading this and you know that you have sinned, see, I mean, it calls you to repentance by saying that Job did not need to repent, implying, in other words, that, well, if you're doing something wrong, stop it. <laughs> By saying what Job didn't do, it teaches us what not to do. Job was blameless, which should prompt us to check our hearts in the midst of a suffering to make sure that we are blameless in the situation. Because what we do is we make it every, we make our problems everybody else's problem, and then try to make ourselves innocent victims and bystanders. Right. You know, I had nothing to do with the situation. It's like, oh. Um, so especially in that one chapter where Job goes through the list of things, you know, I haven't I haven't done this and this and this and this. He even says, I haven't lusted after another woman besides my wife. That was nowhere in the law. Like, regardless of whether Job came before or after Moses, that wasn't even in the law. Like, he didn't have to appeal to that, but he did anyways to show, you know, I, I'm, I, I haven't done anything wrong here. So suffering comes from ourselves. You know, if we get ourselves into a problem, it comes from others. If other people are doing something, like I said at the beginning of Job, Satan himself did not take uh, Job's camels and whatnot. He sent this, you know, these other groups. Um, it can come from natural disasters, like uh, a fire. Um, it can come from Satan, obviously, and it can from, come from God. There's a lot of different causes for these kinds of things. But one thing that C.S. Lewis said, and I reference it last week and I write it again here God speaks loudest and we listen clearest in our sufferings I think that's from the problem of pain um, so God's answer which really takes up the last of the books I believe it starts in chapter 38 um, he didn't really answer the question we are still left with why is this happening to me with a bunch of possible answers which we have deduced from our own reasoning from Job from elsewhere in the Bible but nowhere in Job is there a definite clear line of action of how to figure out um, what's going on, um, and which kind of leaves us with this conclusion. Trust God for who he is, not what he does. If God doesn't answer you, if God doesn't 
fix the problem. You don't tr trust God or choose not to trust God because of that. You trust God because that's who you know who He is. He's God, so you trust Him. Even when He does things you don't like, even if He does things you don't understand, you just trust Him, which is really what Job did. Job didn't always say the right thing, but he trusted God even in the midst of the, the, the depths of his sorrow. So I really think that that's that's a really important point. If we don't understand fully how nature works, which is this is the summary of God's first response to Job. He goes through all the different things with nature that Job has no idea how it works. And so the idea is, if we don't understand fully how nature works, how can we possibly understand how God's morality or character works? And if you read through there, you can kind of get the more in-depth. I'm just – he he asks Job a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, so I really didn't want to go verse by verse. But in chapter 38, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. See, it's a reversal because the whole book he's been questioning God. Right. Um, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched out? Who stretched a measuring line across it? So here we have sarcasm from God, which I think is really funny. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and maybe slight irritation. I, 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 I might be. I may be reading into that, but it seems like slight irritation. Um, so the, after he goes through these long series of, of, of question, questioning, the basic idea here is you don't understand how nature works. You can't possibly understand a more complex idea such as my character and my justice. We can't attain full knowledge. And maybe the answer is not the point, which I think is a big point of Job is that the answer, having the answer is not the point. Which is very frustrating, yeah. because when we're going through something, we want an answer, but then to then realize that maybe the answer isn't even the point, and maybe the answer won't even satisfy me. <sighs> That's <Satisfying>. very frustrating. <laughs> that, that even makes it more frustrating. <laughs> so, but then there's also the aspect that we can't really attain full knowledge, and there's going to be a part of us that never fully understands why God does what He does. We like to put God in a box that we can we can deal with him. We can deal with what's in a box, you know. Right. Think of when you go to when you go to Taco Bell and you get like a, a taco box. You, you know it's going to be in the box. You know you're able to open it. You know you're able to rearrange your food and everything. We like right. God to be in a box like that. Okay, right. these are God's different aspects. You know, here's here's his justice. Hold the cheese. Here's his you know this. Well, God's not like that. God's just God's a very complex thing that. Um, there's a guy that used to go um, come to Yams. His name was Scott, and he actually brought up a very valid point. It it was that he brought up the philosophical idea that um, like looking at shadows on a wall from a fire. And uh, I don't know if you guys remember this discussion, um, but you know the person who only sees that they're going to think that that's what the reality is. But if you just turn around, you would see that they're actually people with a fire and everything. And it's kind of the same thing with God. God is really unknowable. The only reason why we have any knowledge of God is because he has made himself known. Yeah. And so in Job, that's really the, that's really God's main thrust of his argument. I'm up here. You don't understand the things that I'm thinking or the things that I'm doing. Well, that's just very illuminating. Um, many people in suffering ask God for answers, but they really don't want them. They want purpose and they want comfort. Behind it, even even when we ask questions, even when we when we demand answers, our main purpose is usually um, to get a purpose. We want to know that what we're doing has a reason behind it, and then we want comfort. We want to know that that things aren't always going to be like this. That that we don't have to feel like this all the time, um, and we want to know that God is with us. So let's go to it a little bit of time of discussion now that I've kind of introduced these ideas. Have you ever been condemned for not having enough faith? And if so, would you like to share? No. I mean, I haven't been condemned. I, you know, you lose faith when you go through trials, but I don't think anybody. I'm more specifically talking about somebody else um, yeah. attacking you. Um, I I knew some people who their uh, son was on drugs, mm -hmm. and the uh, pastor and his wife told them that it was because they didn't have enough faith that they needed to just have more faith that he would get off the drugs when they wanted to take him to counseling for and let him in rehab. 
they told them no, that that was a bad idea. They, they just needed to have more faith. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. That's a new one. I have honestly <laughs> never yeah. heard that before. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. I'm a little bit blown away. <laughs> yes, it was a special one, all right. I remember a story that my mom said about my great grandpa. He was the one who who started this church, and um, he actually ended up dying of uh, a brain tumor. But he also had um, something else at the same time. I forget what it was. I think it was um, like body cancer and brain tumors or something. And they kept praying, and God did heal him of this other thing that he had, but then let him die for the brain tumor. And I don't really understand why God would have done that. I, I don't know. Maybe because he knew that he was going to die, so he wanted to show, yeah, I can heal. I'm just not healing in this case. I don't know. Either way, it had kind of a traumatizing effect to the family. Uh, and they kind of had this idea that, you know, why, you know, was it because we didn't have enough faith? Was it because God doesn't heal? Was it because something was wrong with my prayers? You know. Right. Um, right. Huh. And, uh, Another runner-up question, somewhat related. If you could ask God any questions and he would answer without reserve, what would it be? Any question you could ask God right now and he would answer you right now. What would you ask him? You looked like you were going to say something. Yeah. Why do I have to uh, go through what I've been through throughout my life mm. up to this point? Anything specific or just Into everything? All through what I've seen, like my parents getting divorced, mm -hmm. going through what I've gone through on the other side of me being divorced, mm -hmm. you know, going through all that, why am I... What, what purpose did you have? Yeah, I know. I know what yeah, you mean. Exactly. It's like, why? That's a good one. I noticed that you specifically mentioned uh, the divorce, though. Um, how old were you when that happened? Nine or ten, around nine, ten. Kind of a little bit confusing. Yeah. I At one point, uh, when I was 12, I just in my head, why was I born mm -hmm. as a human? Why, why, why was I born to see through that, you know? <laughs> yeah. I can understand that. Uh, and, and it seemed like it hit harder for me than my brother mm -hmm. who was only two years younger than me hmm. and but he it didn't really face him hmm. much kind of maybe kind of maybe shaken your idea of yeah. How the world works when yeah, your parents exactly. yeah. can't quite figure things out is exactly. that kind of. And I thought my foundation was turned upside down. Uh -huh. And that was it. So, how did life change for you when that happened? It was scary. It was confusing. Did you did you, did you you go with your mom or with your dad? or? I went with my mom. My mom had custody of both my brother and I. Now, every other weekend, we spent time with my dad at mm. my dad's house. But, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was a lot of adjusting. Yeah. So now some time has passed, oh, you know, yeah. now you're in your, you're, you're in your late thirties and that happened when you were not even 10. Yeah. So looking back, it, 
what did you learn anything from it or or, or did I, you get any closure or any answers from it or, no, or? Uh, never uh, it just it's it's been hard for me to have uh, to be close to anybody mm -hmm. I kind of had trust issues I got gotcha. you trust issues kind of like will they leave me too exactly okay you know where you know and I experienced that having in school where all of a sudden I either I move to one one place one school to another or I befriended somebody mm -hmm. and then suddenly they move out so I had a little bit of trust issues yeah you know. <laughs> I mean I can understand that yeah You know, it, it kind of makes you think. I wonder. I wonder if Job, you know, had to struggle. Yeah, right. You know, with his yeah. life, like, is God gonna take all this away from me again? Right. It, you know, it's gonna be. Yeah. That, that's actually that brings up a whole new dynamic of Job yeah, that I never even exactly. thought about. Because it says that he lived for quite a long time afterwards. Right. Like, go ahead. it could have been, but all of that through that time, back in of his mind, just wanted. Will this be the day that everything gets taken away? Right. One thing that I was always very curious about with the story of Job is uh -huh. uh, in one verse, and I, I don't remember where it is, but he says, the thing that I feared the most has come upon me. Mm -hmm. So was that like something that was in his mind all the time that he was going to lose? You know, that's a, that's a good question. Time. Like, was he constantly paranoid? Right. <laughs> I know that when you struggle with things, now I don't, I'm not I'm not trying to diagnose Job with this. I'm I'm not right. saying that at all. Right. But I know that people who do um, struggle with like anxiety and stuff, they'll they'll sit there and think of all the worst case scenarios. Yeah. And then if one of them happens, like I knew this was going to happen, yeah. but I'm not trying to say Job was like that. But it does bring up an interesting question. And once again, another answer that the Book of Job never really gives us. It doesn't give any as any backstory. Like. Uh. <sighs> Was he sitting there freaking out like it? <laughs> right. And then after it happened, was he like, okay, it's happened, now I can move on? Or was he, you know, like we just discussed, where he was paranoid about this? Yeah. Was it like something that he had to, you know, because for the story's sake, it ends there, you know, but for reality's sake. What what happened to him after that? With all of this? Did God give him some kind of reassurance that he wouldn't, or did he just? We we don't know. Yeah, exactly. Ah, that is that is that's a whole new dynamic. <laughs> May, because remember, God never gave him the answers no. as to why this happened in the first place. Right, exactly. So technically, Job could have believed that it might happen again in the future. Right. With. No indication no. that it wouldn't. Um, uh, what, what is God going to say? You know what? I gave you all the hands over Satan. Satan, he just did whatever he wanted. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you would be like, oh. Well, well that's a terrifying uh, idea, God. Exactly. Can we not do that? Uh, <laughs> could you not put me in your wages? <laughs> I don't care if you have that much faith in me. <laughs> but with all this being said, it is very interesting that one of the biggest things that Job keeps saying over and over again is that he just wants to be vindicated. Which, I'm sorry, but really? Like, let people think that I'm wrong. Let people think that I'm that I'm evil. Just, t just fix this. Like, right. why? <laughs> I just find that that that's odd. So one more th one more question, and I I really like the like the discussion and everything. Um, what character do you relate to, to the most, and why? And I'd really like everybody's opinion on this. So I'll start first, just so you don't feel like I'm picking on all you guys. I feel like I relate to Elihu the most, and the reason why is because he's this young guy that that thinks he can just go go in guns a blazing and fix everything. You know, he's gonna have the right words that's just gonna fix it, and that is so me. I'm like sitting there watching for who's got problems, and I'm like, oh, I, I've got your solution right here. And I, you know, I, I have all this head knowledge from from all the all the studying that I've done, and just, oh, I'm just so anxious to show you all how you're wrong, <laughs> you know. And, and and that 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 young arrogance, I really relate to that in life. You, I really really do. Uh, and Dana, which character do you feel like you relate to the most? I don't know. You don't know? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. Check. You know, I 
it's it's hard to say. Like I feel like don't say God. <laughs> I'm just I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. Like I feel like, especially in my family and stuff, like a lot of people come to me for answers and uh-huh. stuff. That I'm just like, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, so I, 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 I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so that would make you God in the story, huh? People keep coming to you for answers, <laughs> and you're like, man, I don't know what's going on. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm joking. Uh, Nicole. Honestly, like, given my family, uh-huh. I kind of feel like, and relate to, like, Joe. Because uh-huh. I always feel like I'm having to just, like, I didn't do it. <laughs> I missed it. I, I've done nothing wrong. You know, it's just like, I'm always feeling like I'm having to stand up for myself. It's, uh-huh. just, it's like, I'm, I haven't done anything. So it just, it, it's really kind of really relatable. So it's just like. The I book as a whole is relatable? Yeah. It's just like, I haven't done it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I know that uh, I know some of your background, but like, uh, for instance, um, you know, growing up in legalistic ch- churches, I, I you kind of had some history with that too, from what I understand too. Uh, you know, a big thing of legalism, legalism, legalistic churches is, you know, the whole we know everything, you are wrong, it's always your fault, and it's like oh. So is that kind of part of what you're talking about? Yeah. Um, did anybody else have some? Did I did I ask everybody? I didn't ask you. I'm oh. so sorry. I'm so sorry, Zach. <laughs> I am so sorry. I, okay. I got it. I, I know, heard right? the door and it threw me off. I'm sorry. What character do you feel like you relate to the uh, most? Job. Job. Yeah. Because you, you have all the all the like she was saying the suffering without answers. Yep. And that things that you know ever since we started getting into this, a few things that happened. Already, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, why is this happening? Yeah, I feel as same as Joe, mm-hmm. Joe is, is, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll you know, pray, you know, praying, uh, you know, this and that, and, and you know, yeah. To... <laughs> but you know, one good thing of this, I, I don't know if this is if this will make you feel any better, but I mean, one good thing is is um, you might be able to to help Colt, you know, try yeah. and figure out this whole situation yeah. because you've been through it. You yeah. know. I've been through the yeah. eyes of a child. Yeah, and, and and especially since you were so young when it happened. Yeah. You know, so I mean, for whatever it's worth. I know, right? You, you know, I I know that's a small concession, but yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. If it makes you feel any better, right? Right. Okay, so let's look a little bit more specific. First off, he mentions uh, two things called the behemoth and the leviathan. Um, there's no reason to assume that these are not just a simple hippo and crocodile. Okay, so I could get into the whole background of that, but I'm not going to. Um, so if your Bible will say behemoth and, and leviathan, there's no reason to assume that it's anything other than a hippo and crocodile. Okay, um, so uh, as I mentioned this week and last week, um, and I believe the week before, for uh, Elihu is completely skipped as though he had never spoken. Right. And I even mentioned last week about how the whole – all the chapters of Elihu could just be lifted out of the book, and the book would have had perfect flow. Right. Job has his lengthy lengthy, uh, lengthy uh, complaint and then goes straight to God. But Elihu is inserted right there. Um, so um, Job's sins and suffering are completely skipped over. But Job nevertheless is humbled when he realizes the difference of perspective between him and God. And I think that that's so important. God, God never once talks about in, in his in his main in his main speech here. He never says anything about Job's sins or lack of sins, either either or. Yeah. And he has um. And on the whole issue of Job's suffering, he hasn't responded at all. He goes straight from Job is in this is in this place and place asking for God, and this is this is the first thing that God says directly to Job in answer. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? In other words, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. You have no idea what I'm doing. It's like, oh uh I I don't think you understand here, God, I was wronged. Do you have to come over here and cuddle me and make me feel better? But, but he completely skips that. 
And then he goes in verse 3, Brace yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. Well, that was a drastic change. I mean, just a second ago, I was asking you, and now the whole thing has changed. So, uh, even though that's, that's completely skipped over, Job is still humbled when he realizes the difference of perspective between him and God. Completely blows him away. You know, he, he, he thought he understood the situation, and then God shows him all these things that he doesn't understand, and how great he is, and just somehow changes Job's perspective on the whole issue. Um, maybe a key point of suffering is to seek more of God, not more answers. Mm -hmm. Because remember, Job seeks God, and he's rewarded for it. Yeah. Job's friends pretended to have all the answers, and they weren't rewarded in the end. Mm -hmm. um, and yet the answer was never given. So that kind of brings us to, to, the, to the problem here. Maybe a key point of suffering is to seek more of God. Maybe that's one of the one of the points of Job. Probably. Although Job was blameless, he did have a wrong attitude. He questioned God's integrity, and he maintained somewhat of a rigid legalistic obedience to God. Um, he even talks about this, which kind of bring. I'm glad Chuck brought that up about the the thing that I feared. Is it possible that Job did some of the things just to try and get God? To not bring about punishment. Because right. look at what it's – and I want you to seriously think about this. Not so much in when worship of God so much as in fear of God. Mm -hmm. Okay, Legalism. Now hold on. Let, let me show you what I'm talking about here. It says that he used to offer in chapter 1 or chapter 2. I think it was chapter 1. He says he used to give offerings in case one of his kids it's, had sinned. Yeah. So then the kids die and he has his friend over here say – it was because of their sin that they died. And then Job says, at the same, around the same time, he says, the thing that I feared has come on me. So it kind of raises a lot of interesting questions there. A lot of interesting questions. So, all the, But one thing about Job, guys, is it doesn't have details of what is going on. It has speeches. It sets the scene just like a drama does, and then it's, it records the dialogue just like a drama does. If you've ever read Shakespeare, it, it reads like a Shakespeare. But it doesn't describe the actions of what's going on. Now, that is the part that kills me. That's why I like the historical books more than the wisdom books, huh. is because they give you a setting. They paint something. What, what's going on here? This is a right. canvas. Right. But in wisdom literature, just kind of like you, you have to – it. it Everything that happens in wisdom literature happens in your own mind. Yeah. You know what I mean? It happens in theoretical and, and, and stuff. It, I mean, it, it briefly says that Job was in this land of us. Okay, well, that's fine. But, I mean, it's completely irrelevant to the discussion. So although Job, Job was blameless, he did have a wrong attitude. And God used this as an opportunity to help Job grow. See, Job was blameless, but he wasn't perfect. Which means that the suffering that God was able to bring by was still able – he was still able to use it to teach Job something. Because Job wasn't perfect, he was blameless. So it didn't it wasn't without purpose. Okay, now even though it wasn't God's punish or God's uh, judgment, it was Satan's testing, God still turned it <coughs> to good. See that's, that's one of the things that, that I'm so thankful for Job for is because not everything is ordained by God or caused by God. Some things just happen, but God uses all things and he turns and twists it to where it makes uh, us you know, get draw closer to God. It makes it makes a better outcome, not necessarily than what could have been, right. but a better outcome than what would have been had God not intervened. Um, okay, so um, he questioned God's integrity and me, he maintained a, a rigid legalistic obedience to God, um, which kind of brings up another very in, in, uh, important point for the whole book of Job. That God is sovereign. He's the one in control. He's the one pulling, you know, calling all the shots. And even when Satan thought that he had, you know, figured out some way to cause punishment, he still not even Satan understood what God was doing. So over all these things, God was the one who was in control the whole time. Now that's just yeah, that just blows my mind. Go ahead. Um, uh, your point about maybe a key point of suffering is seek more God. Mm -hmm. All growing up, I've always heard, you know, if you're if you're not seeking God enough, God's going to bring stuff around to make you seek him more, um, hmm. you know, start little and then grow bigger to, like, death, you know. Okay. Uh, death of a loved one or something, you know, um, to get your attention to seek more of him. Is that something that's actually in the Bible or just something that we've... Uh, that's not what I meant when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, 
uh, let me kind of explain the difference from what, I, from what I meant. It's always been one of my fears all growing up because I've always heard it as like, oh crap, if I'm not fearing God, I'm going to lose my husband, I'm going to lose my kids, I'm going to lose my husband. Something bad's going to happen so that way you see God more. See, know? the biggest problem that I have with that view is that it, it makes God an unfeeling, unsympathetic kind of douche. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just who just yeah. wanting wanting to to instantly crumble you anytime you have the slightest slip. I don't know, but that doesn't seem like the God I know. Gideon, here's Gideon over here worshiping false gods, hiding in a wine press, and God shows up to him and calls him something completely different than what he is. A mighty warrior. It's like uh, I don't think that you know what you're talking about here, God. <laughs> I don't think that means what you think it means. <laughs> But then to say, you know, God's this guy that, you know, you didn't see, you didn't meet your quota this week. What's the quota? Like, yeah. how much do you have to see God before? That kind of makes it all about works. Yeah. In other words, if I'm a good enough person, God will bless me and bring me to salvation. But if I'm not good enough, then God will completely devastate me. It says that Job was blameless and he God still devastated him. If he's not safe, then who is? <laughs> Jesus was perfect and he... Right died on a cross. I mean, that doesn't sound like the best way to die. So I don't think that that really has that much weight. What I meant is that during the sufferings, we learn to trust God in a different way. And it's not that we weren't weren't seeking God before, it's just that when we seek him in the, in the trial, first off, it gives us an opportunity to really seek him because when you seek him with nothing going wrong, I mean, it's not that it's not genuine, it's just that it's harder and more sincere when you Surrender to God in the midst of a problem. Yeah, it's like when you choose to worship when you really don't feel like worshiping. Mm -hmm. it, that's yeah. real worship, even yeah. though you don't feel it, feel it. That's real worship. Yeah. So I, I really don't think that, that has any any bearing. And I and I glad you brought that up because I don't want people to think that that's what I meant. Chuck, you. Um, I, I've I've heard that before too. You know. Um, Do you have any thoughts or? Yeah. Um. I I agree more with with your point. Like okay. Like when my kidneys fell. <laughs> was I, that because you weren't seeking God enough? Right? I, I wasn't seeking God, but it gave me a window to make a decision of, okay, I'm going to continue to seek God and seek him even more. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. So will God, will God... You know, measure out your quotas and everything, and then curse you otherwise. I don't see that anywhere in scripture. I don't really see that that's um, even taught in scripture. I, I'm gonna say that's a no, unless that you can give some kind of scriptural thing that we no, can look at. No, I never at. heard scripture. It was just taught <laughs> in scripture. I think that's kind of like one of those things, like God helps those who help themselves. Is like that's an idea. Mm -hmm. It's not in there, but it's an idea. Uh. Just kind of going off of that. And I think a lot of people that do hear that, I think that's what kind of turns them away from the church a lot of times. Yeah, it's because it, of it that, scares yeah. them away. Oh, yeah. I, I've seen a lot of people be like, well, I heard this and that's why I don't go to church. I, I heard feel a lot like of that would scare me to church more because it's like, oh, crap. If I don't go to church, then God's going to do this and this Maybe and this that's me. the reason. The last Maybe. generation did a lot of fear tactics. I don't know if yeah. you know this, but Revelation was oh, so well. that you could be afraid of going yes. to hell. and yeah. <laughs> Everything demons, was about demons everywhere. demons everywhere. And if you didn't seek God enough, you were going to be possessed just like that. And it was Everything was about fear with that generation. It was like, no wonder my generation is on panic attacks because you guys instilled fear in us and everything. <laughs> <laughs> It's like on Arrested Development, the mom's like, don't touch that, you'll light your head on fire. I don't know why you're so afraid all the time. Uh, <laughs> well, gee, I don't know, mom. Anybody else want to say something? I didn't mean to cut anybody off. Okay, good. Um, great, great discussion tonight, guys. I'm really excited about this. Um, so if you cannot even stand against a crocodile, another thing that he says, why do you think you can stand against God Almighty? Another good point. <laughs> and then in verse, chapter 42, verse 7. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. See, God doesn't even address Elihu. He says you and your two friends. He doesn't say anything about Elihu. Yeah. Oh. There were a total of four people recorded talking to Job, and God only responds to three of them. So that's kind of... Yeah. So, um, with that being said, I want to ask a very important question.
question here that 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 is is how so? It says here, I'm angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So Job has spoken the truth about him. How so? Remember, Job was the one who said that God laughed at people who were suffering. <laughs> yeah. That same guy. <laughs> uh, you know, Job was the same guy who said, you know, uh, I'm going to die without, without no. you know, being vindicated. Right. You know, the things that he said, I mean – some of those things were wrong. So the real question we should ask here is, how so? Yeah. And one part of it is that Job's friends were hypocrites. Mm -hmm. They were trying to impress God. They were they were trying to flatter him with their words, like, oh, maybe God will, you know, take it easier on me because, you know, I I so elegantly have praised him. You know, some people do the exact same thing nowadays with like fasting, for instance. If I fast, then God will, you know. Give me blessings and, and you know remove all my trials and we'll be on good terms and because I'll have that one up on God. Uh, and it seems like that's what they were trying to do. In fact, Job calls attention to these things and calls them liars and enemies and those kinds of things. So I, I I think that I think that him and him and God both understood the fact that they were not being sincere. <laughs> um, also, he may not have said all the right things, Job that is, but at least he didn't put on a front. Job was real with God. He didn't pretend to be something he wasn't. He genuinely didn't ha didn't understand. He genu genuinely sought God. Mm -hmm. Also, jo Job's basic premise that he was not suffering for sin was correct. So God might be addressing the general idea of what Job was saying. I'm not suffering because I have sinned. What Job has said about me is true. Mm -hmm. Because his basic premise was, was, was true, even if he misstepped on a few of the other things. In other words, God was looking at the collective whole instead of as a sp at the specifics, which, if so, should encourage us to not worry about having to have the perfect prayers or anything. Um, another thing, uh, Job responded correctly to God's rebuke. After after God um, says, well, tell me all these things if you know, uh, the first time he basically says, uh, I, 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 I spoke a little bit too much now. I'm going to stop. And then the second time he says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked who is this that obscures uh, my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Job, might, God might be talking about this. It, after I rebuked Job, he responded correctly. He spoke what was true. You guys did not. The whole time, then and now, you, none of you are saying what's true of me. That might be what he's talking about. So we have a few different answers, and once again, like so much of the book of Job, it's left to you for you to ponder without clearly spelling it out, because that's the purpose of wisdom literature, to get you to ponder, which to me kind of drives me insane. <laughs> but what? But that's actually a good point. For Remember I said about how Job is, is helpful for counseling. That's another <laughs> helpful point for counseling. There's something wonderful about the dialogue itself. The dialogue itself between you and the person you're counseling. I don't know how that works, but evidently even God thought so. Okay. So in 42.10, it says, After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Now remember the fact that his dead kids were still dead. Yeah. God did not resurrect them. See, I never noticed that until I lost the child. And then I realized, oh, oh, Job still had to live with the death of all those kids. Uh -huh. Oh, it's one of those things you don't really think about until you're in that kind of situation. You're like, holy crap. So remember that. Yeah. Just because Job gave him more kids doesn't mean that he didn't have to bear the grief of his lost kids anymore. Right. So, I mean, that's kind of a, I don't know, I see it as kind of a big point. Um, but we also see a few lessons here that are emphasized again later by Jesus. First off, pray for those who persecute you. His friends did nothing but tear him down. But yet, God still expected him to pray for them. Huh. Not only is that a little bit frustrating for me, I would have been like, God, how about I say that I prayed and that I don't really pray and then you strike them yeah. with lightning or yeah. something. something. Something bad. Boils. Give them give them what you gave me. Just give them my wife. Pass it on. That's good. Yeah. See, and also, there might be a contrast there. Um, since yeah. you brought that up, that's a really good point. Uh, there might be a contrast because the book of Proverbs, Proverbs talks about how, um, you know, he who finds a wife has found, found a good thing, but it also warns against, you know, a nagging wife and that kind of stuff. So it kind of gives a lot of balance in Proverbs. But then in Job, we see 
an example yeah. <laughs> of a bad wife. But nowhere in the book is does it condone divorce based on that. In fact, no. divorce is only um, al allowed. It's only said to be acceptable in the confines of um, what's called sexual immorality. Yes. So um, something that's important. One thing that I think that, that the last generation didn't emphasize is they, they talked about a lot a lot about divorce, which I get. Divorce is a big deal. But there's some things that they never they never looked on. First off, spousal abandonment. When one person's divorced and they didn't have anything to do, like, what if they didn't have a say so? The, the, what? Yeah. You're still condemning them? I'm <laughs> like, yeah. no. that, that's just not, that's not fair. I mean, you, yeah. this yeah, is not fair. Like, yeah. Another thing that I think is really important is that divorce is even more important as it applies in the bigger, like, let me, let me oh. okay, let me give an example. We are the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. How much more should we not divorce one another? We're the same body. Let's resolve our situations. Let's not take each other to court. Right. Let's not ke uh, keep bitter attitudes towards each other. Let's forgive each other. And I think that that's a very important lesson from divorce that was completely overlooked by the last generation. So, anyways. Um, also, we see the lessons of forgiving and showing mercy. In 42.11, it says, um, All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. Where were you then? You don't see Job saying that. Even though none of those people were there for him. None of them were there for him. When they came, he just let it go. That says a heck of a lot about Job's character. That he just let it go. They're here now. You know, you you might go through times and you say, that, that person, they abandoned me. They weren't there for me then. That was then. This is now. Let it go. Just let it go. They're here now, and that has to be good enough. So they might have messed up and messed up in the past. Eh, let it go. You staying bitter at them is not going to help the situation at all. It's not. So in 16 to 17, um, after this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation, and so Job died an old man and full of years. So basically, the idea here is that he died content. So that kind of gives us a little bit of hope for us, you know, how much grief and the problem never having the answer, living in kind of paranoid, living in grief, all those things. This kind of gives us a little bit of hope in that aspect because it says here that he died content. So that, that's good. And he was granted more years so he could witness the kids. Okay, well, that, these are all seem like good things, which brings a very important point. Without struggles, there can be no victory, and that's just the way of life. Boy, none of us want, str want struggles, but we all, want, we all want victory. Well, so... um. A few last things. So many solutions are supplied throughout the book. Nothing you can do. Just curse God and die. Uh, repent for your sin. God doesn't care. Um, suffering is an opportunity. That's what Elihu said. Um, and wisdom books are definitely for a reflection, but ultimately there is no single solution given throughout the whole book. Um, so the breakdown here, God's first response is recorded there. Then Job has this very quick, I've been talking too much. <laughs> and then uh, here God has a second response. And then here he says, he, the basic summary here is I, re I reject my question. Just I reject that. I reject what I've said. Um, and then and there is the conclusion of the matter, if you're keeping some kind of a summary of the book, I don't know, um, which has justification. Now, the whole time he was wanting to be vindicated, he was at the end. Um, forgiveness, he had ample opportunity to be angry at them, but he still forgave them. And it has blessing. God blessing past the suffering. So uh, a few very important points before we close out the lesson is here at the very – or at the one of the last things that Job says in 42. He says in verse 4, You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you, and you shall answer me. My ears had, had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, different translations read this differently, and Isaiah brought it up last week, so I wanted to make sure that I that I um, em, that I emphasized it. Um, it's it's not in the first line of verse six; it's in the second line. It's not therefore I despise myself. It's here and repent in dust and ashes. Why did he need to repent if he didn't do anything wrong to have gotten the suffering? Now, the the obvious answer is is well, he's repenting that he asked God, you know. 
not necessarily that 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 he sinned in the beginning, but just that he questioned God during the time of suffering. You know, I, I was gonna say a lot of people being like, "Well, you shouldn't question God." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I honestly don't believe that, and the reason why is because there's a more logical solution that is available, and I always go for the most logical solution. Right. Um, repent can be translated as "I'm sorry for questioning" or "I'm consoled in my sorrow." Um, the the word repent has a lot of different um, different meanings, and one of it one of its meanings can, is more of being consoled. So, in other words, if it's if it has that meaning, which seems more likely, it's I and repent in dust and ashes. Is I'm consoled in my dust and ashes. In other words, even though I'm I'm still in my suffering and I haven't gotten my question and my questions answered, even though I'm in this place of just despair, I, I'm comforted because you've you've answered you have answered me and you 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 vindicated me. That seems to make more sense when we take Job as a whole. Yeah. But it could t potentially be repent. It, it could be. That that raises questions for, for what Chuck just says. Can we ask God questions or does he not have any – you know, can't ask him any questions? That, that's a whole other can of, can of worms, and I just don't really feel like it's it flows with the rest of the book to translate <laughs> to repent. Yeah. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. That's my own personal view. So because God vindicated him and proved he was Job's friend, this brought Job comfort. See, throughout the book, there was kind of like this question like, is God my friend? But then at the end of the book, it's, oh, God is my friend. And I think that that, that, that mattered to Job, knowing that even though I don't have the questions, at least God is, is – he's not the enemy that I at one time accused him of being God. You know, really just important issues with Job. And I hope that I haven't given you the illusion that we've covered the whole book. I mean, we've.